Right, so I just need to put the finishing touches to this final Lambda function. So I've got my list, my create, my delete. I just need to really simply manage all of these products. So I'm just gonna add this get endpoint. So I've got my product. If the product is null, I wanna return the not found yet. But then if it's found, I wanna return the actual product itself. Okay, fantastic. Now I've got these four different Lambda functions that are gonna be deployed as four independent functions on AWS behind Amazon API Gateway. And I just wanna make sure that all of these endpoints work before I actually deploy this to AWS. Now. I'm sure there must be a way I can just hit debug, but how do I debug an a Lambda function that is just a method? Okay, well, I should have just built this with ASP.NET because I've got no way to test this damn thing locally. I wish I'd not worked with serverless. I should just go back to running things in a container. Ah! Hi, I'm James Easton, and in this video, you're going to learn how you can leverage .NET Aspire to dramatically improve the local development experience you have for building serverless applications on AWS. Now, I want to be honest with you all just to get started in this video. I was the first person to be critical of .NET Aspire when it was first announced, a tool that seemed to make it very, very easy to build distributed monoliths, that you can wire together a whole lot of microservices in a single .NET project, right click publish and hey we're building microservices no thanks not for me but if you start to think about dotnet aspire a little differently you start to think about dotnet aspire as simply a replacement for docker compose and i mean that not to oversimplify all of the fantastic work that's gone into aspire i mean that only as a good thing because i'm sure none of you like writing yaml do you really if you think of it like that, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Powerful, not only because you no longer need to write any YAML, powerful because you get all the power of .NET as a language to programmatically set up and test your application locally with full debugging support, as well as starting up any additional resources that your application might need. Things like your database, your messaging layer, and you can wire all of them things together using .NET Aspire. Now the support for Aspire and Lambda is a relatively new thing. Published Aspire support for things like the AWS CDK a little while ago now. But in March this year, this blog post appeared on the AWS Developer Tools blog, talking about the specific Lambda integration for Aspire. And once you've had it, and once you've added the Aspire hosting AWS NuGet package, it's as simple as calling the add AWS Lambda function method on your distributed application builder, passing in your actual Lambda application project, the name of your function and the actual Lambda handler you want to call. This will actually, when you start your Aspire project, will actually start up all of your Lambda functions locally running on your machine. You can invoke them, you can step through them, but, that's not all you might want to do because maybe you're building Lambda functions that are sourced by API Gateway. In that case, you've got a collection of Lambda functions that all come together to make up your API, where historically you might have just had ASP.NET, you run your debugger in your IDE and hey, you've got an API. Now you've got these lots of little Lambda functions that are all operating completely independently brought together behind Amazon API Gateway. Thankfully, this support for AWS Lambda also adds support for an API Gateway emulator. As well as adding the Lambda functions, you can also call this add API Gateway emulator method, which will then allow you to pass in the individual functions that you want to add as the individual functions behind this API Gateway, as well as the HTTP method and the specific route you want in your API for this to operate on. I know what you're thinking though, what does this look like in a real project? Don't worry. There's a GitHub repository in the description below. And let's have a look at what that actually looks like now. So in this GitHub repository, there's examples for how to use .NET Aspire to simplify your serverless development, whatever functions or service provider you're using. For today, let's focus on AWS. So we've got this product API project. The product API project uses the Lambda annotations framework to specify a relatively straightforward CRUD-based API for managing products. There's a delete endpoint, a post endpoint, a get, all products and they get individual product endpoint. The actual contents of the Lambda function code is largely irrelevant. There's then this iProducts interface, 
which is implemented by DynamoDB behind the scenes. So what you've got here is the pretty typical serverless API. You've got API Gateway, you've got Lambda, and you've got Amazon DynamoDB. And now you want to run this locally to make sure that everything works as expected before you ship it up to the cloud. So let's see how Aspire can actually help here. And if I go over to the .NET Aspire project now, you've got this serverless.aspire.aws project in here. And we just have a quick look at the NuGet packages that have been installed. So you've got the Aspire hosting AWS package, as I talked about earlier. And you've also got the DynamoDB SDK installed. Why I've installed that there will make sense in just a second. And if we have a look at the actual startup now, let's actually have a look at what is happening here. And the first thing you'll notice is that you're actually starting up DynamoDB local. If you're not familiar with DynamoDB local, this is an AWS supported local emulator for DynamoDB. Now I'm usually not the biggest fan of trying to emulate the cloud locally on your machine, but for things like databases for persistence layers and the fact this is supported by Amazon themselves, using DynamoDB local I think is a really good trade-off. And because you've added that aspect Aspire hosting AWS package, you get this add DynamoDB local extension method. I can call builder for my distributed application, add DynamoDB local and give it a name. This will start up DynamoDB local running on my machine. Now the next thing along here, which is quite interesting actually, is Aspire has this ability to subscribe to different events that are happening to the resources inside your Aspire project. So here you're going to subscribe to the resource ready event for the DynamoDB local resource. What this will allow you to do is to run some code once DynamoDB local is running successfully on your machine. The reason for doing that is so that we can actually create the DynamoDB table that our Lambda functions are going to access. So inside this function here, I'm first going to retrieve the endpoint for DynamoDB local so I can get the endpoint called HTTP and I want the URL. And then I just need to create some dummy AWS credentials. The AWS SDK is required that there are some credentials passed in. You can then create a new DynamoDB client passing in the service URL that you pulled from your Aspire resource and the dummy credentials you've just passed in there before then calling the create table async method. This will allow me to create the DynamoDB table locally inside my locally running instance of DynamoDB. Now, the way Aspire works is that whenever you start up and shut down Aspire, all of the additional containers are start up and shut down at the same time. So calling this create table async method is fine because we can guarantee at this point, we're always going to get a fresh instance of our DynamoDB local container. Now, if you weren't doing that, you were keeping the DynamoDB local container running for whatever reason, you could first do a DynamoDB.list tables call, check to see if the table with the name product already exists if it does exist, don't do anything. If it doesn't exist, of course, go off and create the table. So these event hooks are really, really useful for pre-provisioning resources as you've done here. And then we get onto the actual Lambda functions themselves. So I've defined my one, two, three, four Lambda functions here inside my Aspire project. That's the create, the delete, the get, and the list. Passing in my Lambda function project, which is just called product API, and then the individual names of my Lambda functions alongside the actual Lambda handler. Now, one of the really cool things about using the Lambda annotations framework to build your Lambda functions is that you actually get this auto-generated serverless template. You could use this to deploy your application directly. If you're not going to use this to deploy your application, it's still really, really useful to actually come into this file and get the individual handlers for the individual functions. You'll notice that I pass in this wait for and with reference argument. Wait for ensures that this Lambda function won't try to start up until DynamoDB local has already started. What this with reference method will do will automatically set an environment variable on your Lambda function. Now, this is something I learned as I was putting together this Aspire sample is that if you set the AWS endpoint URL underscore service name, in this case, DynamoDB, this will automatically override the service URL for the AWS SDK. News to me, but this is quite a cool feature. So what you'll notice if you start up this project that there will be on each of these individual Lambda functions, there will be an uh, environment variable called AWS endpoint URL DynamoDB. When you initialize the DynamoDB SDK, that is going to automatically override the service URL to be whatever URL you pass into that environment variable. Pretty useful feature if you ask me. Once all these Lambda functions have been created, you'll notice I'm again passing in a dummy access key and secret key. That's just so that when the SDK is initialized, that it has some credentials 
although it's calling DynamoDB local, so they're not actually used. Finally, I'm going to set up my API gateway emulator. I'm going to say this is going to be a HTTP API, and then I can pass in my individual Lambda functions from my get, my post, my delete with the individual API routes. Will this actually work? Let's find out. Now, one thing to be aware of, if this is the first time you're running this locally and you've never used DynamoDB locally before in your life, your local Docker host is going to try and download DynamoDB locally. It's going to try and do that from the public Amazon ECR repository. You might see this fail. That's because you first need to log in to ECR public. So I'll put a link to this web page in the description below. You might need to run this CLI command to actually log into Amazon ECR public, which will then give your local Docker client the ability to download DynamoDB local. Now, there are some intermittent issues with Rider running this locally. So by way of debugging, I'm going to jump over to VS Code to actually run the debugger inside VS Code. Hopefully, by the time this video comes out, the issues with Rider will be fixed, and you can actually debug your Lambda functions inside Rider as well. But I'm here inside VS Code now. I've set up my debug configuration, so I'm just going to start my .NET Aspire project in debug mode. That is going to automatically launch me into a web browser, opening up the .NET Aspire dashboard. And you see I've got DynamoDB local running, as well as my API gateway emulator and my create, delete, get and list Lambda functions. Now, if you go and have a look at one of these Lambda functions, look at the environment variables, you'll see that this endpoint dynamo DB URL has been added. That is set to localhost 64198, which is the same endpoint that DynamoDB local is running on. So that's all set up. That's all configured. Let's see if this actually works though. So if I open up my API gateway endpoint, of course, at the root, there is no Lambda function. So I'm going to get a not found. Back in my IDE, I've set a breakpoint on my list products endpoint. So I'm going to navigate to slash API slash products. And hey, I've hit my breakpoint inside the IDE. I can step through my code here. I can go and have a look at what's actually happening with the call to DynamoDB. I'm just going to let that continue. And that's going to return me some JSON to my web browser. The other thing that gets packaged up as part of this is the Lambda test tool. Now, if you're not familiar with the Lambda test tool, this is an alternative way for debugging individual Lambda functions, if you will. So you could start up your Lambda functions with the Lambda test tool, and you can invoke them from inside your web browser here. So again, I could come over to here, I can invoke my Lambda function with an API gateway request. That's going to hit my breakpoint again, and I'm going to continue through there, getting some kind of response. If I instead try and invoke my delete Lambda function with some random input, that will throw some kind of error. Here you can see I've not really properly handled a DynamoDB exception. So with this support for Aspire and AWS Lambda, particularly with that API gateway emulator as well, this gives you the ability to debug and run your entire Lambda function projects locally. Because most applications aren't made up of a single Lambda function, you might have a collection of Lambda functions that are performing a job in this case, a CRUD-based API. Now, of course, this isn't always foolproof. Whilst this does allow you to debug your application code, it doesn't allow you to debug things like IAM. Have you configured the IAM roles of your Lambda function correctly? Or whether you've correctly configured the various different event sources or managed services. In this video, you've only seen API gateway source Lambda functions with that lovely little API gateway emulator. But what about functions that are much more event-driven, the kind of superpower of AWS Lambda, functions that react to things like Amazon SQS events or SNS or even files dropped into S3 buckets. How do you test that kind of stuff? Don't worry, you're gonna find all of that out and more in the next few videos. I'll see you all there.